On today's episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, we try F.E.W. American Straight Whiskey. Few. Few? Or F.E.W.? Few? I have no few? idea. I have a few ideas. <laughs> the history of the Gallic lands is one of struggle punctuated by moments of sheer brilliance. Tartan is Scotland's gift to the world, and it is your personal heritage story. Howdy, boys and girls. <laughs> Welcome to Kilts of Culture. I'm Rocky. That's Eric. Yo. Today, very special treat. We have from our friend Robert Bone Steel. Uh, few or FEW, still don't know what how to say that or not say that. Uh, we have American Straight Whiskey. So we're going to try this Ow. one today. Yes. Ah. I make noises. All right. Rotten my ear hole. <laughs> How was your uh, 4th of July, Rocky? It was blow up tacular. Great. Okay. I don't know. Okay. It's love, love I do the I do the firework thing. I live in a little uh cold sack, so do the firework mm-hmm. thing with mm-hmm. some of the neighbors and blow mm-hmm. things up and first time I inadvertently got higher higher shooting uh, uh aerials than I thought that they were oh. for uh explosives Oops. and Oops. scared the wife a bit, but that's fine. Yeah. What's mm-hmm. what's a little shrapnel and uh you know Burning embers Flame, on the flaming on dead grass for between friends, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, indeed. Mm-hmm. All right. So, Robert Bone Steel got us this. So I'm very curious to try it. It's been sitting in the back of the studio on the wall for a little while. Um, it's an American whiskey. Figured Fourth of July. Need a day that released was our American uh, enough. Exactly, America enough for this one right here. Um, and kind of goes along with our uh, new America 250 collection. So we're gonna. And give it a little, get a little tasty taste. So yes, indeed. Ian, you want to come collect your uh, your glass of few F E W American whiskey, American straight whiskey. Ladies and gentlemen, our MC for today, Ian Anderson. Woo! You missed your cue. A quick break from tour. Indeed. So what tartan you have on there today, Mister Ian? The Manx hunting something tartan. Ancient? I forget what the last word is. Something, something. Just call it Max Hunter. That's good. There you go. Beautiful. Go. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. That's a nice one. I always, I, I used to have that in the five yard. I no longer do. I may eventually have to. Uh, it's a good one. Get that one again. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Thou right. shouldst. Okay. Yep. So. Ian what, is, what partner are you wearing? Oh. Well, what, we have to start with you. Yeah, okay. I'm, this way. I'm just right. trying to keep you on track. Uh, me, uh, I'm, I'm wearing really Scott Red Weathered. Okay. Red Muted. Scott Red Muted. Red muted. Yes. Yep. Indeed. The today Ian is rubbing off on me. <laughs> um, today I have on the American Dream tartan in honor of the fourth as well. Mm-hmm. So, yes, indeed. Um, so, Ian, what tasting notes slash smelling notes slash smelling salts? I don't know. Do we have for uh, <laughs> smelling notes? F E W. Yeah, so a whiskey. few spirits, American straight whiskey. We start by hand selecting a diverse and strong backbone of our award winning bourbon and rye whiskey. We then incorporate unexpected notes from a rich yet balanced malt whiskey that has been imbued with cherry wood smoke. So for the nose, we should be getting notes of graham cracker and honey on top with the spire of rye whiskey below. A spire. <clears throat> spire. Below. A definitely spire. Below. Below. Indeed. It, it, definitely they getting, stabbed it and then turned it upside down. Definitely getting the oh, rye. Like tree. Definitely getting the sweetness. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that I would yeah, have said those sweet. things specifically. I smell cherries. Like okay. I smell a little. I think the cherry is coming through a little bit mapley. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely getting the cherry wood. But I don't know about graham crackers and whatever it was. Yeah. S'mores and everything. S'mores. Yeah. And... All right. Graham crackers and honey. Honey. Okay. So it's breakfast yeah, cereal. Broadly sweet. For taste, this cherry wood smoked malt whiskey combines notes of tart cherries and smoke with the sweetness of bourbon and the spice of rye. Hmm. I get a lot of cherry, a lot. Not Very so much. much the smoke. I definitely get the uh, the Bernie, the rye um, spice. Yeah, 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 spice. spice. Yeah, yeah, I'm feeling good, the, the, the heat on the edges of my tongue. The sides of my tongue. <clears throat> I'm trying something different when I'm drinking. I'm no longer, you know, uh, aerating through it. I'm actually just like moving it around the mouth a little bit. I'm getting it, the spice all over the tongue mm-hmm. for this one. And I'm like, it's pretty common for rye. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, definitely, it definitely tastes like rye. Oh, that's, this is a weird reaction. I don't know why I'm having this, but I'm like I'm salivating a little bit right now. Like it's, okay. I, I'm getting more 
you know, saliva in the I mouth. I get that sometimes too. Taste. Hmm. What is the style of scotch that um, Glen Livet makes? What is what is, what is that region of yes. scotch? Speyside. Speyside. Or, yes. Okay. Speyside. I think I think ryes are like the American version of a Speyside for me. Okay. In that yeah. way, the spiciness in particular. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think if yeah. you if you like rye whiskeys and you want to try scotch, maybe going with the space side is the way to go. First yeah. time I've had that thought. Open it up. Do you, would you like some water for yours? Um, or no? Yeah, I have, I have mine. Okay. It's like so, a Bernie rye and sherry. The finish yeah. it should be subtle. Sherry. Finish is subtle with hints of white pepper and honey. White pepper. Okay. Uh, if that means bitter, then I'll, I'll believe you. Just generally like spicy. I'll, I'll take it. So spicy, but spicy. Yeah. It's a spicy meatball. I think the water has only like intensified some of those things for me. No, water cut it way down for me. Really? Yeah. Much more palatable for for me who doesn't like, you know, like bourbons or whiskeys as much. Um, It's it's definitely cut it down. I have a still have a tiny bit of metallic-y kind of taste on it. Um, But yeah, it cut a lot of the pepper out. You say metallic, yeah. I, th- I just have a bitter aftertaste. Okay, it's kind of bitter on the on the finish. Hmm. Hmm. I I did I do like the nose of it. I'm a meh on mm. the uh, on the on the taste. I think but the I water do like really cuts the nose. Yeah. Yeah, I can see what you mean. I think mm. I like the smell better than the taste. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Ian, what do you give it? Score one to ten. This one's a little disappointing for me. I really wanted to like this, seeing that Jace liked it so much. And also, I believe I was conceived in the same town this was made in. Um, but yeah, I'm going I'm going four. Four. Straight four. Okay. Things on your bingo card you didn't need to know about today, where Ian was conceived. <laughs> I don't actually know for sure, but that is where my parents lived when, uh, when it's, I was. It's still more than I need to know. Fair Eric. Enough. Uh, Lover's Leap references aside... Um, <laughs> I'm kind of with Ian. I would give this as a rye or a bourbon, maybe, you know, maybe a 4.8. It's not great. I think it'll, it'll mellow, but it's okay. Okay. I'd mix with it, but I wouldn't enjoy it straight like I am now. <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm going to go a little bit kinder than you guys are on it. Okay. The, uh, I'm not, I am, I am not a rye. I'm not a bourbon guy. Um, but that said, it's, it's it, especially with the water. It's not. It's not bad. Uh, I'm gonna go five point two. Did you notice so. the cherry went down with the water? Yes, I feel like a I lot lost, of things went down. I with lost it. all the cherry flavor. Yeah. yeah. So should hmm. not encourage me. Indeed. All right, boys and girls, we are as always, but your humble servants here to answer your questions, whatever you have about kilts and or culture stuff. Um, so load those down in the comments, and while we're waiting for you to start with those, Eric. Ah. Give me, give me Check this something out. to chew on. Matching, matching lapel pin and uh, clipboard. Clipboard. Yeah, it's so nice. Very cute. Very no. adorable. Okay. All right. Um, first up, we got Randy Frazier, 8307, uh, who says that uh, my brother-in-law married into the McGorry clan, which is a sept of McDonald. He isn't sure if he should wear a kilt because he is Italian with no Scottish heritage. I think we know where we're going to go with this one. Okay. <clears throat> so, you're Italian heritage, not Scottish, and you married into a family that has ties to Clan McDonald. Um, should you wear a kilt? Could you wear a kilt? Are you allowed to wear a kilt in that tart? Um, my my shorter answer. My short answer is absolutely. Um, the 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 beauty of of one of the beautiful things about marriage is your combining lives it's it's your life and her life or his life now together as one Mm -hmm. so you are accepting or their family is accepting you in the same way that your family is accepting them hopefully uh (laughs) knock on wood ideally Um, yes ideally so the to me it is the in 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 many ways it's the ultimate sign of respect for saying like hey your family has this tartan. I want to experience your culture. I want to experience where your family came from, what your family celebrates, and that kind of thing. In the same way that I'm sure she wants to, you know, experience Italy and in, in your Italian heritage. Um, the I will I will you know relay it to my own personal experience. Um, my mother-in-law is 
like her she is a hundred percent polish her her ancestry dna kit was a circle period it's a solid <laughs> a solid thing her her parents were off the boat polish you know spoke polish in the household coming up like her, her entire life kind of thing um so when we do stuff with you know with my wife's family it's you know we do chenstahova has a, a polish festival and the the excitement and the you know, watching my mother-in-law and her sisters you know get so excited about that side of their family and having the brother-in-laws whether we're you know german of her of german heritage irish heritage and italian heritage as the brother-in-laws are um we still go to chenstahova we still have guamkis we still have pierogies we still have babka we, like we still have an experience all of the food, especially the foods, but also the music, the umpa bands, like running around, you know, experiencing and, and having fun with the Polish stuff and uh, letting them see us be excited about their heritage in the same way that, you know, when, when you know, Rick, my father-in-law, you know, go, wants to go to Celtic Classic up in Bethlehem. He will, you know, he is of Scottish descent. So, you know, they will, you know, Sue will come along with Rick to Celtic events. And she enjoys that with him in the same way that we enjoy the Polish stuff with her. So that is part of the beautiful thing about the diaspora. And it's not just America. It happens, you know, in Canada and Australia and other, other you know, countries as well. Mm. But that is the beautiful thing about a country like America is the melting pot, salad bowl, stew, whatever you want to call it. It is that. It is experiencing and celebrating different cultures and not diminishing one because you're celebrating another. It's you can have fun at both separately and enjoy it for what it is. And then, you know, just kind of blend it and, and just have fun with the whole thing and celebrate different ethnicities and different cultures. Eric. Yeah. Me. Um, yeah. What he said, I would basically just say um, the advice to the brother-in-law is what we say to each other and to people we know all the time, which is try to be a sincere student of the culture, learn something about it. Um, it may be that the wife in this situation has not done as much research into her heritage as she'd like, or maybe she's new to it as well. This is a chance to share and explore something together. So I'd say, you know, try and be a sincere student and just enjoy the journey. Yeah. And if you want to get a little, um, formal about it or make it a, an, an event, let's say. Um, maybe talk to uh, the wife or the in-laws and you know, directly ask, let's say it's the, it's the father-in-law. I don't know. If your father-in-law is the one with Scottish heritage, then maybe talk to him, especially if you have a good relationship with him, help build that relationship mm -hmm. by going to him and saying, hey, dad, look, I'm, you know, I love that you guys have this culture you're you know you're you're steeped in it you love it you're enjoying it you're expressing it um would you mind if i became part of that as well would you mind mm -hmm. if i wore a mcdonald uh, tartan kilt to honor your guys heritage and you know being part of the family now i just want to i want to get in on the fun i want to have fun with this as well and i want to experience a little bit of this as well and yeah. you know heighten the whole thing and if if you have a good relationship with a man or a woman, whichever side of the family it's on, um, they, they can't, they probably wouldn't help but say like, yes, of course, uh, that'd be wonderful. And you're just deepening right. the bonds right. of your, your of your familial caringness, love, whatever it is. Um, you're just deepening those bonds with her family mm -hmm. in a meaningful way. So I would say if you really want to, if you if you really want to score some brownie points, I would talk to that in the same way that like when you're going to get married, the old school thing to do is, you know, hey, I'd like to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage and you ask the father before you ask the daughter. You could do this a similar kind of thing. And hey, this is your guy's family heritage and I want to be involved. Is that OK with you? And it's just it's a it's a great sign of respect, um, it, or at least I would take it that way if I was him. Uh, I think there's a possibility that they, they probably already know or might already know that the family is cool with it, but he might be concerned about the reactions he would get from other people out in the world. So the answer to that is not your not your business. <laughs> not <laughs> am, your I, am I Scottish? Yeah. No. My lovely wife is, and this is her, from her side of the heritage, and I really dig it. So have a Coke and a smile. Yep. And And frankly speaking, I don't think many people are going to question it or or freak out about it if you ask if if you're walking around um 
you know, at a Celtic festival, probably no one at all. If you're walking out to the grocery yeah. store in your, you know, in McDonald kilt, someone says, oh, are you Scottish? You're like, no, I'm mostly Italian, but my wife is really into her Scottish heritage and I got this kilt to honor her. That That is a, a, a good as answer as any on mm-hmm. why you would want to do something, mm-hmm. why you would want to wear a particular tartan. You know, I wear, not not today, but I have a couple different Stuart tartans that mm-hmm. I wear because my wife and her family are Stuarts. Right. And, you know, they, they love the fact that I want to, you know, express that and honor them in that way. Mm-hmm. So. It's very romantic also, frankly. Yeah. You can also just easily just say, I like kilts. Done. Yeah. But, yeah. Indeed. Go for it. Done. <laughs> I hope that helps. Wash day. Exactly. All right, Ian. Yes. What do we got out there in the interwebs? So I've got a question here from Seamus. He wants to know, have the number of textile and tartan makers in Scotland increased or decreased in the last decade due to the spike in Highland wear? That's a very interesting question. Hmm. How are we measuring the spike? Fair. That's the first question. Has the spike been over a decade? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say the spike has been much more than a decade. Um, it's it's more of a, a steady tick up since the mid 90s. So since Braveheart, it's kind of gone up and up and up and it's not really come down too much. Mm-hmm. I think Outlander, the Outlander effect has definitely, you know, given a bump to it. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I, would, I would hazard a guess, this is only a guess, I would hazard a guess that the rise in Scottish nationalism and that kind of thing with the in- independence referendum um, twice um, has kind of, uh, uh, promoted it a little bit more and had a, people were like, yes, I'm, I'm Scottish. I want to wear a kilt. I think that's probably added to the discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's, there, there, there are no new tartan mills that I'm aware of. Um, they're, they're the same mills that have been out there. And have, are mills going out of business or conversely or? Um, I'd say there was, there was a period where there was some that were going through some problems. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Dog Leash had issues and ended up um, selling to one one of their customers. Um, and I'm not sure where they are in their life cycle at this point, but I, they, they still exist. Um, there's, yeah, I'm thinking like Batley's, Martin Mills, uh, Strathmore, uh, House of Edgar, La Caron, Elliott. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's several tartan mills. And a lot of times tartan is not like the, the only thing that the mill does. A lot of times it's, they, they weave tweed and tartan, or right. suiting fabrics and tartan, or school wear and tartan, or solid color wool stuff and tartan. So there is a lot of, uh, yeah, they, they don't necessarily just rely on only the tartan industry, only the heritage industry to keep their business float. Frankly, it's it's probably a poor way to <laughs> run a mill Possibly. if you're only relying on one particular thing yeah. as a set of customers. Yeah. Um, but I'd say that potentially the the ancillary businesses like kilt makers or Highland wear shops, maybe more of those have popped up. Okay. Um, okay. I don't think there's there's a great need for, I, I'd like there to be more tartan mill options, but I don't think there's a great need for like a dozen more or three or four more um, tartan mm-hmm. mills. I mean, it's it's pretty, it's, it's, it's easily handled by the ones that exist. Mm-hmm. Um, Ingle, the Ingles Bucking was the other one that they're, Another mill that went out uh, or was about to go out of business and, you know, Ingalls Buckin stepped in and bought it. Uh, maybe that was the one we were thinking of earlier. Maybe. But anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I'd say it's, it's kind of, it's grown. Yes. Not necessarily in tartan suppliers. Um, and I don't think it needs to. From from an aspect of the, I it, if I had to guess, the mills are doing fine. They're not setting the world on fire, making billions of, you know, they're not burning hundred dollar bills to light their cigars. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but you know, they're not destitute either. Um, so I'd say they're, they're in the middle. They're, they're, they're existing. There's, you know, four or five main mills. Um, if you add another two or three, that will mostly water down the ones that already exist, which will cut into their profits, which will then potentially hurt some of the mills. So I'd say I almost, in some ways don't want a bunch more mills to exist. I want the mills that are that are existing to be as solvent and as good and as forward thinking as possible mm-hmm. while also maintaining the quality standards and all the tartans that they're currently doing. Mm-hmm. Is that a, a, a 
businessy way to look at it, I guess. You tell me. You're the yeah. business person. Fair. So, yes, that's my thought. <clears throat> but I agree about the uh, accessories. I think there's more stuff yeah. in the scene in general. There's more people trying to do stuff that's a little more artisanal. Um, and they realize they can do it because they see that there is more interest. They, they sense there's an audience for their product. So, um, you know, jewelry makers and artisanal sporn makers and stuff like that. That's I think that's where you're really seeing it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And that's probably where it'll go a little bit more mm -hmm. over the coming years. I think so. Cool. Hope that helps. Good question. Yeah, agreed. Eric. What? Hey, uh, Jennifer Berry, this is almost housekeeping, honestly, asked us, uh, will you guys be at the Celtic Classic in Bethlehem this year? Answer is yes. Yep. So, the uh, For those yeah. who don't know. Yeah, every year. We go up to Celtic Classic up in Bethlehem. It's the last full weekend in September. And we actually have um, a full booth there. Um, you know, we bring you know, half the store um, in, in staff as well as in product. Mm -hmm. um, and we are set up there all weekend. And then we also do a live uh, version of Kilts and Culture. So they are, they are kind enough and weird and dumb enough, I guess, <laughs> in some ways, to give Eric and I a platform um, physical platform um, to have a live show for about an hour over in the Heritage yeah. Hollow area. So if you are in the the Bethlehem area, the you know New York to Philadelphia corridor, please stop out. Um, Kilt the Classics. The it's in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, last full weekend in September. Right. Yeah. We are especially psyched this year because our friend Allie the Piper is going to be headlining there this year. Mm -hmm, totally, mm -hmm. totally stoked about that, as they say. Uh, Albanox is going to be there. Albanox is going to be there. Other, oh, yep. also friends of ours from way back. Yep, yep. So it's going to be a lot of fun. If you're going, I do recommend making your plans now, especially if you want a hotel room, because it will get busy, busy pretty quick. And yeah, there are options. I think if you, there's probably still options to book a hotel closer to the venue now. Yep. But it is huge. It is absolutely worth going to if you've never been to it before. Agreed. And yeah. stop by, see us, and then after the show, we usually hang out and chat mm -hmm. for a while, mm -hmm. and you know, raise a glass and just kind of continue the conversation because we're mm -hmm. only allowed an hour, and we are much, much, much more long-winded <laughs> than an hour will allow for. That's for sure. So indeed. <laughs> All right. One. Do you want to do another one? Sure. That or? was really short. I can do yeah, another one. Yeah, was a short one. I can do another one. Of course, I can. Um, Marshall Bill. I mean, Bill Marshall uh, said. Uh, I'm thinking about the day played as an extra warmth layer, don't we all? Uh, can you simply use a felted woolen blanket or are there specific specifics to weight and shape that makes it specifically a day plate? Would you look like a numpty who doesn't know what they're doing if you do anything other than a certain type of plate? Yes. So what, is there a correct way to do the day plate? Bonus Which, points for using the word numpty. Yes, Indeed. pretty much so. Indeed. He's not um, a numpty because he knows how he knows what the word numpty means. Exactly. So um, so a day played for you know for those who don't know is it's a piece of cloth or a blanket um, that's roughly two and a half yards long by 55, 60 inches wide. Um, essentially it's just you wrap it around either wrap it around your upper torso or just fold it and leave it over your shoulder and it's a picnic blanket is really what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so does it have to be in the same tartan as the kilt? Does it have to be Worsted woolen cloth? I don't know. You tell me. You tell me. Uh, not really. Um, it often is. Uh, you'll occasionally see something that is very much a homespun as an option for a day plate. I think if it's a more formal outfit, a more intentional as an accessory, as well as something practical, uh, something you're going to wear because you're a, a high mucky muck going to Highland Games, which honestly is where you see them the most often, to be, to be completely honest. I don't know how many people bother with them on any other kind of a basis other than it's something to wear to Highland Games. Um, the origins of them uh, are a little murky and I don't have the exact answer, but my understanding is it was probably more likely a Lowlands thing than a Highlands thing. Uh, it is not, to the best of my knowledge, a half a great kilt, the way fly plays and stuff are considered to be, yeah. you know, half a great kilt. That's, 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 yeah. that's the lore of it. It's not the truth. but. Um, it was, a, it's most commonly was used by shepherds, uh, people watching flocks and it seems to have been more common in the lowlands than the highlands. 
Uh, the fact that it's usually referred to in the context of like sheep and sheep herding implies it's a little bit later in period than something related to cattle. Um, the shepherd's check, hence, uh, was first seen as you know the Northumbrian mm-hmm. tartan was basically seen as worn as a day played before anybody ever thought of making a kilt out of one. Now it is very much used as a kilt and identified with that region. Um, but it first started off as the common homespun pattern used for a day plate. And it was entirely a practical thing. When it made the conversion over to something that especially clan officials and clan lairds would wear to represent at the, at the Highland Games, I don't know why I keep doing this. Um, I'm not sure, but I think it's because of the romanticism of it. Um, even well past the point where people uh, were using it to stay warm while they're stuck in one place watching a bunch of sheep graze and it's really getting nippy and you can't really move. Um, it felt romantic and felt like the thing to do and occasionally would come in handy. You know, I've never seen anybody actually using one as a picnic blanket. I mean, in this day and age, usually there's folding chairs at Highland Games, you know, or if you're if, maybe if you're hiking with one or something like that, you know, actually hill walking. Yeah. Then you could use it for that. So I would say that if you want to do it correctly, I would encourage you to consider getting one in actual wool. Okay, not not felted wool, really. Um, and I would encourage you that you make it a matching tartan to your kilt, just because it's going to look a lot cooler. It's going to look more awesome. Um, you could technically use any blanket, but it's something that's not very homespun looking and is not wool, uh, especially something that's felted and fluffy looking, isn't going to look right. Right. I think the fringe is very much part of the look on those also. Yeah. 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 So. I'm trying to think. I've, I've seen, I know I've seen like uh, clan chiefs at festivals or you mm-hmm. know, at, at Highland gatherings wearing them over the shoulder. And I know yeah. that they don't always match the kilt or it's a much, much bigger right. pattern than what's on yes. the kilt. Um, but I wanted to say that they were like lamb's wool or something like it looked more blanket esque mm-hmm. mm-hmm. in the photos that I'm thinking of in my brain. And I'll try it. Well, it we... might be a looser weave. Yeah. But I, don't, I wouldn't equate that to felted like you said like felted wool yeah um i think that would be the wrong way to go but uh i also think it's just they're just less common these days most of the Mm -hmm. pictures i see of guys using them are vintage pictures so yeah it's it's superfluous you you know Mm -hmm. if we're at a at a festival and you happen to have chairs then i'd rather sit down in a chair than on a blanket Mm -hmm. but at the same time you could use it for those types of things mm-hmm. too or to you know little little extra warm flair if mm-hmm. you need it or something to wrap around the shoulders of your lady friend uh-huh indeed you can be very very chivalrous with it yes good point good point so mr ian yeah so i've got a question here from andrew grunwald he says hello from south africa how important hello. how important do you think the role pipe bands play in keeping the kilt culture alive as opposed to pure fashion or lifestyle in South Africa, it seems predominantly pipe band driven. Mm. <clears throat> the that's a really good question. Yeah, um, one thing we we've said often is that the kilt s- stuff, the heritage of of kilts and culture, it always goes back to the traditions. It always goes back to the standard bearers. It goes back to the people wearing it traditionally, not like sans underwear traditionally, but worn as a full outfit traditionally. It goes back to pipe bands and those guys carrying the, you know, the 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 torch of it into mm-hmm. the future kind of thing. Mm-hmm. There will always be fashion. There will always be people wanting to play with it. There will always be people wanting to interpret it in their own way or wear it, you know, you know, as as a fashion accessory or as a thing, as a plaything to some degree. Mm-hmm. But you always, always, always go back to the thread of tradition and of heritage. Because without that, if it loses the heritage, if it loses the tradition, if it loses that story and that association, then it's just a fashion plaything and means nothing. And that's when it just starts to evaporate and when it becomes uncool, it just goes away. So you absolutely need pipe bands, you need the standard bearers to be there. I think on the other side of it, you can still play with it. You can still have fun with it. You can still make it your own, but you need the balance on either end of the fulcrum. Yeah, um, I would agree. I think also this is this is this is kind of gets vague, but you keep saying standard bearers, and the other point I want to make is that it's also very much the military. 
Um, now, in Scotland, unlike South Africa, you have the tourist industry, which has helped. And it's kilts and traditional Highland stuff, not just Highland dress, but Highland culture, Scottish culture, has gone in and out of the zeitgeist around the world over the years. I mean, there was, we talk about this often with uh, going all the way back to King George's visit in 1822 and the rise of Scottish nationalism. And that actually continued well through the 20th century as a, a common drone note, shall we say, of uh, tourism. Tourism, earlier than most people realize, even, even into the 18th century, was something that was drawing people up to Scotland. And the romanticism of it was always kind of there. In terms of the visuals, it came down to the regiments, the Highland regiments, and the pipers. And most of the time, that was what it was, unless at a particular time in history or in world awareness of culture, something pinged. Like there are certain times like uh, World War II, you know, there are, there are examples of, you know, when Americans first started seeing England, seeing Britain, being stationed in, in Scotland you know, before D-Day, and they started running into this stuff. And I was like, bing! And lo and behold, you start having a few movies coming out in the 50s based around Scotland, like We Geordie was, was a movie which I was just looking at some art for recently. Um, little things just kind of popped to the surface in the zeitgeist and in popular culture. But the military side of it and the musical side of it with the Pipers is always there, you know, just always. And if you look at, hell, if you look at like whiskey advertising, you know, both good and bad um, in the UK and also in America, it's almost always like a bagpiper or it's the old country gentleman in his kilt, you know, with the huge sideburns, you know, uh, and his tweeds. So I think you it that's kind of there as kind of an icon in terms of actually having the culture going in a material sense it's been weddings and funerals for the most part until as we were saying earlier recently when more people have gotten into hey you know this is not just something i should say for special occasions i can enjoy this anytime i want and heck it's also comfortable and looks good when but yeah absolutely true um i my earliest memories of the kilt were movies i was watching with my dad like freaking gunga din <laughs> you know old movies and bagpipers you know, and that it's definitely a standard bearer for sure. Not the only one would be my, is the real takeaway I'm trying to give, but very important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the military nod. It, it's mm -hmm. yes, a hundred percent that just as well mm -hmm. as the, the bagpipe bands. Very much so. Yeah. Cool. Hope yeah. that helps. Eric. Hey, it's me. Okay. Noah Barnett. Hey, are you ready for this? Hey, Noah. Hey, Noah. What do you know, Noah? Just a fun what if imagination exercise for you. Okay, you ready? Ian, you'll probably have fun with this too. If you could rewrite <laughs> a sci fi or fantasy show or movie or a video game so that all the characters wore kilts and island wear or some variation thereof, which one would you choose and what would that look like to you? Hmm. So hmm. we're definitely far away from, <laughs> from tradition at the moment. So tradition, sci-fi reimagined. Re yes, Ian, bring Ian in for this as well. We'll with, start with, with you. With tartan and kilts and all that. This, this is a fun question. It is tempting to want to do Star Trek because you can still have all your jokes about killing all the red kilts. Uh, my <laughs> actual answer is um, Lord of the Rings. A, because I'm a big Lord of the Rings dork. That's probably my biggest fandom. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting in the way that you can like represent all the different groups of elves with their different tartans you know you can tell that okay. they're elves of mirkwood or elves of lothlorien or elves of rivendell based on their tartan alone and that can be helpful if you're watching a battle scene if you care to get into the details over you know which side is making this advance if it you know, even gets into that i mean the same with the dwarves hmm. same with the men so dwarves are already scottish what are you talking well about? true <laughs> malt beer red meat off the bone thanks hollywood but you can tell you know which troop or band that they come from depending on on which tartan they're wearing and you know you don't need to know any of that if you're just enjoying the movie for yeah. the spectacle and the entertainment yeah. of it all but if you really want to get in the weeds like a dork mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. you can really you know mm -hmm. do that wow okay and then it inspires all of like how how would elven leather work <clears throat> to go with their kilts look different than dwarven leather work versus i mean i guess the dwarves well i've been to the ren fair so i already know the answer <laughs> to that but um fair enough ren fair where the history is mm -hmm. um I was expecting you to talk about Star Wars. 
Okay. I didn't realize you were as big a uh, Lord Tolkien of the Rings fan, nerd yeah. as a. Oh no, I've always been a, a much Star bigger Wars Lord of the Rings door. Okay. Uh, my initial uh, AIM screen name was Aragorn One Five Zero Two. Very nice. It's hard to Very get Rocky nice. to talk about Lord of the Rings though. <laughs> mm. Mm. That's fair. Okay. I enjoy it. I'm just not that that into it. Okay. Mm. I've seen them. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because you have no soul. I know. Fair. It's fair. I'm I'm a little stumped, honestly. Um, I mean, I am the resident Trekkie to a large degree, so I, it's been done kind of. But I do think that kilts would go great with Starfleet stuff and some of the uh, some of the alien cultures as well. But I, would, I don't think I'd put aliens into kilts. I would just have it be a, a Starfleet thing. But I want to think of something more fun, what more off the beaten path. So let me let me fo- let me percolate on this a little bit. Okay. The for me the. Uh, shout out to the 501st Kilted Trooper Brigade. Mm-hmm. I think Star Wars, there's a very, very obvious, you can do a lot of things within that. I could see, you know, the the stormtroopers wearing a particular you know, black and white Menzies-esque tartan or yeah, yeah. Ewoks wearing great kilts or something to that <laughs> effect. Uh, little tiny great kilts. <laughs> yum, yum. Um, but they the, look like piles of laundry just moving around <laughs> <laughs> with a lot of extra dryer lint. <laughs> the Jawas are almost there already. Right. But the... Uh, <laughs> Um, here, no, no, no. here's what I, here's what I actually like to see. I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, you know, we're, we're going to, I'm going to put off, you know, an existing one and I'm going to okay. go kind of go a slightly different direction with it. I would like to see, um, a, in, in the, in the same vein as like the HBO John Adams series, a, a quasi serious historical type film done about Bonnie Prince Charlie. Or, mm-hmm. or series mm-hmm. done about Bonnie Prince Charlie, okay. showing him not o- like for all his faults, for all of he, what he was. Um, some people I, you know, idolize him. Other people think he was the ruin. Uh, so it's the great pretender versus, you know, <laughs> the, so I want to see that. I want to see a deep dive into Jacobite stuff. Okay. With so you're Bonnie not, Prince not Charlie. Going to you just want correct gritty like, hyper realism. Yes. And I want to, I want to go from like, beginning of his life through the end of his life. Mm-hmm. Um, it mm-hmm. didn't end well, spoiler alert. Um, oh man, but I haven't the, read uh, that one yet. <laughs> um, uh, but I want to see, that's what I would love to see. I'd love to see a hyper-realism kind you of get, You and your wife are really into historical drama anyway, yep. right? Yep, what was yep, the one yep. you're, you were watching recently? It was ben, we, ben Franklin was another ben one Franklin. that just kind of came out, yep. or, so out or just, just is coming out in steps with like Michael mm-hmm. Douglas or something. Mm-hmm. Um, great, He did a great job. Um, the uh, John Adams one on HBO. Right. Uh, who's right. the? I forget the the actor's name. Um, uh, I'm I'm bad. I'm really really bad with actor names. So uh-huh. great, but that's a very very great series as well. Mm-hmm. So stuff like that, or even even like Downton Abbey or, or uh, Peaky Blinders, where they incorporate you know, like the costuming is really well. Really good. I got okay. So I got I got two answers now. But I wouldn't go. Right. Th- I wouldn't go the Outlander route. I wouldn't make it fantastical. Mm-hmm. I would. I would try to stick more to fact, and then you fill in the drama where there's gaps in the story where no one knows the answer. That's where you fill in with the drama. So I, I think. I think that'd be freaking amazing, and it would really do well. So I, I support the idea wholeheartedly. Um, I still reserve the right to criti- criticize the details when it comes out. Sure. Um, so I got two answers. One. Uh, this one's for more, probably more for some of the ladies in the audience, but tell me, tell me if you agree. Uh, at the end of the last season of Bridgerton, uh, the, uh, the one couple were going to live up at his family estate castle in the Highlands. So I would love to see, and I would, I would cringe the whole way, but it'd be funny as hell and possibly still eye candy would see, uh, Bridgerton up in the Highlands and what the hell they would do with that. It'd be off the chain, you know. Uh, those who know the series know that they take certain liberties with the uh, Regency era fashions. Um, so that would be highly amusing. Uh, my other answer is uh, I was recently watching uh, a Netflix anime called Blood of Zeus, which is actually pretty good. Mm-hmm. I've actually enjoyed it, and it's like it's 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 basically a fresh story with some liberties taken, and oh, but mostly a lot of nods to try and keep it keep it very solidly rooted in actual Greek mythology. And what we need, and I've said this many times before, is to stop neglecting Celtic mythology 
and I would love to see a freaking Blood of Zeus style anime show about Celtic mythology, Irish, Scottish, Gallic in general, um, the old, old, old stuff, you know, like, you know, Kukla, yeah, and... well, yeah, and the, the Twatha Danan, uh, which I always mispronounce, Twatha Twa, Twa Danan, forgive me. Um, anyway, that would be freaking off the chain and would be awesome. And the gorier, the better. So <laughs> that's what I'd like to see. You want fantasy with kilts? Do the freaking Celtic myths. That would be awesome. I agree. It's like and the then we need a palate comic. cleanser watch Bridgerton. <laughs> it reminds me of the Saltier comic. Exactly. Like but superhero but, yeah, type but, of a thing. But not, but this is this be like hmm. high you know, high fantasy based in mythology. Yeah. Hmm. You know. So. Interesting. So I know you didn't want to do Star Trek, but imagine all the different like factions of Klingons and different Tartans. That could be fun. Oh yeah, I could. See, oh, I could see Klingon. I know Klingons. So I mean, I could see Klingons <laughs> having. I mean, yes, Klingon houses are basically clans, right? So so yeah, having having a different Tartan for each clan. Yeah, yeah, the, what, yeah. I don't want to get into all the suggestions folks have shared, but I should mention the the best one. Somebody wants Spaceballs three. The search for Spaceballs two. All kilted. <laughs> that would be fun. That would be I agree. very silly. I agree. That was wasn't that like an actual like trying to get made Spaceballs three. The search I think for so. Spaceballs two. I think I think it's work, happening. They're working. Oh, on I it think now. they're like they've announced casting stuff recently. Oh, there's a lot of fake type of news articles about yeah. that type of yeah. stuff. People love too. to play. Fans like to make stuff like that. So too. it can yeah. be yeah. it can be hard to tell sometimes. Maybe cheers. I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Play with my emotions. <laughs> okay. Very good. That was fun. Yeah. Cheers, Mr. Ian. Yes, let's go to another fantastical idea here. Uh-oh. Got a question from Fiber, Fiber by Nature. If you were to create a kilt maker's tartan, what colors would you use and why? Kilt maker's tartan. Yeah. Do you mean a, a, a tartan kilt, specifically a tartan that would be for kilt makers? Easy to work with or a tartan to represent kilt makers? I think the point is to say that you're a kilt maker when you're wearing it. I see. Hmm. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. Wow. Ian, you can stay in for you this can one. Keep, yeah. You can keep your that. Harris Tweed uh, <laughs> little patchy there, boyo. Yeah. It'll be, uh, I They're... guess, like a like a tan or like an off-white for the machines of most brands of single-stitch sewing <laughs> Beige. machines. Beige. Beige. <laughs> <laughs> red for the blood. <laughs> you always thinking, got red for the blood. I'm thinking blue either for uh, the the a very common seam ripper brand that often comes in blue and or the the slider on the sewing gauge. <laughs> okay. 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 Like a bright electric blue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, I was going to go like kinder to our kilt makers and uh, ourselves and be like, it's going to be a very simple pattern, black and white. So it's easy as hell to sew right. and easy to right. see the different colors yeah. versus something that's go. like super subtle. Uh, uh, hmm. Wow. Yeah. It's interesting. Like, there's a there's an ant there's a question buried in here about how busy you make it because certainly being very busy gives you a lot of lines to work with, but it can also yeah. make any tiny errors very noticeable. Mm -hmm. So like, or any well, tapering, well, any tapering. To have spikes in the back. Okay, yeah. but 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 then that introduces another idea that like this is this is a rite of passage tartan. Fair. Like you're not you're, you're not, not officially in maker. the guild until you can you actually make a kilt from tartan. this really yeah. horrendous horrible tartan. Yeah. Snatch seam ripper from my hand. Mm. But even the answer is you don't want anything too simple and too large and blocky and not busy because that can have, have challenges and in its own right. I'm trying to think of numbers that you could put into it. <laughs> like uh, I'm going into I'm still going down the rite of passage thing. It's like you need <laughs> you need to visit an American Indian reservation and take peyote and sit in a sweat lodge and you must be there for thirty days while you sweat and try uh, to make this kill in the dark and see like and squint, do it by candlelight and try right. to get the so I could have just sat in the truck with the windows rolled up. Oh, and it's, made and from very, it's made from various metals, so yes. it's much harder than wool. To you have to feel. Sew. You have to feel. Strip your sewing machine in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> this is my sewing machine. There are many like it, but this one is mine. I was just about to do that. <laughs> oh, you have to. You have to actually sew it with a piece mm -hmm. of staghorn. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, you have to weave it yourself. Ooh. You have to weave it too. I sheep to shawl. No, nah, kind of I felt the, it. Um, the, the <laughs> set size is such that it is in like the pattern is in even inches, <laughs> perhaps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you always know if you're looking at the at the set. It's what it, when was when was Wilson's of Bannockburn founded? Uh, Seventeen. It was right after, uh, right before prescriptions were lifted. I think. Okay. 
So 17, was it 83, 17? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so it was right around that time period. And then they, they ended their 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 run in the early 1900s. I want to say 1920s. I'm trying to think of numbers that you could do for thread count. That would be cool. Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. That's hard. That's good. Color symbolism. Gotta have red for blood. Always have red for blood. Did I say it already? Always have, have red for blood. You have to have the muted um, muted green for Wilson's Bannockburn. They're, right. they're stock yeah. shade. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I have like gold to represent the royal writ, which some 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 okay. some, some people, some companies okay. get. Um, wow, what else? Hmm. I have a brown to represent the wood of the original looms, like the, the pre-industrial. Dob cross looms. Yeah, okay. dob cross okay. looms. That okay. could be neat. Um, yeah, I like it. There's a, All right. wow. So down in the comments, tell us what colors you would put into a kilt making, kilt maker tartan and yeah, why. How, and how you... complex or simple would it be to torture yourself with? <laughs> You've got to have some red in there for the blood that you spilled due to the needles that, that missed think? their mark hmm. for, for Morgan's blood. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Morgan's blood? The more or the Morgan. Morgan's <laughs> brother. Okay. That was fun. That was a th- I, mm, Okay. Uh, not marketable though. Uh, let's see. Out that attitude. Don't at me. Uh, Randy Frazier, a three zero seven, has a uh, an etiquette question. Uh, if you're a Mason, uh, do you wear a sporin when you're also wearing a Masonic apron? I've seen people wear it on top of and also under the apron. I'm not sure which is better or appropriate. Um, and we did actually. <clears throat> Call in, call, call a friend, a lifeline. Yep. call a lifeline for this one. Yeah, the um, I I thought I knew the answer. We did, but yeah. I wanted to verify, make sure I wasn't. I'm not a mason, so I wasn't you know stepping on people's toes. Um, essentially, all the masons we spoke to, all all seven hundred ninety six thousand of them, <laughs> four. Um, oh, four? Yeah. The wow, um, I thought it was only the, two. The masons we spoke to basically said, um, no, nothing goes on top of the apron. You do not wear. You should not wear your sporin on top of the apron. Um, for those who don't know, when you're you know, when you're at lodge, you generally get dressed up for the event, and it, whether it's a suit or whether it's a kilt, you wear a a an apron across the front of you um, that has some sonic symbolism on it, mm-hmm. and the uh, uh, that you don't put things on top of. So um, several masons said that either they'll wear their sporin under it. I've had uh, Robert Hughes, uh, one of our moderators in the Kilt Culture Group, actually said when he puts on his, his on, he actually wears his sporin to the side. Mm-hmm. Um, Rob, our IT guy, is a mason, and he said that he'll wear it in, um, and then you'll put the he'll take his sporin off and kind of put it underneath his chair right. so right. that it's, he doesn't have the, the bulge of the sporin in front underneath the apron. So generally speaking, if you're going to wear it, yes, you can wear the apron on top of the sporin. Um, it may be a little bit uncomfortable, so either wear the sporin to the side or put it underneath the chair or, you know, hide it. Yeah, if it were me, I would just remove it. I think Rob's got the right idea. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, you don't want to have a lump in it. Yeah. It just look weird, especially if there's a photo op at some point in the evening. Yeah. Yeah. True. So, there you go. Yep. That's about Simple. it. Simple. Yeah, Ta-da. pretty much. Boom. When in lodge, do as the lodgings do. Indeed. And... Yes. I've got a question here from Brian G. He says, me and my fiance are looking at getting a tartan sash for her to wear over her wedding dress. I am Clan Stewart and her family is Clan Turnbull. Should we get a Turnbull sash or a Stewart sash? Hmm. For her to wear. For her to wear. Yeah. Yes. Over her presumably white, but not necessarily wedding mm-hmm. dress. Mm-hmm. The, uh, there's a few different ways you could look at it. You could look at it as um, a, a lot of times that are s- sort of standard esque answer, especially if, if the if the woman has no Scottish heritage, is the guy has a sash pre pinned to the appropriate length, and then at the at the time in the ceremony where you know you may not kiss the bride or you know where you know I now pronounce you man and wife, you know he can actually drape the sash over her to symbolize, you know, she's being accepted into his family and now it's official kind of thing. Um, I wouldn't want to have her wearing her family tartan and take it off to put on his. 
Yeah, um, that would feel yeah, that would feel weird. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you could sew one back to back. I was like, imagining that. that'd be a little that'd be um, interesting, but a little odd. Yeah, it'd be a little bit difficult to do. Um, yeah, I'd say, um, and I don't think I would have her wear another one like a bandolier of sashes. <laughs> um, <laughs> sashes? We don't need no stinking sashes. sashes. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, but I could see the maybe the bridesmaids wearing his and her wearing hers. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, mm-hmm. Or something to that effect to show that it's it's both sides coming together. Mm, or just the, every other bridesmaid in a different one. Yeah, fair. That'd fair. be neat. Um, uh, yeah, really flip a coin, really. And which which one are you more drawn to? Or what does she want to do? That's the bottom line. How does she feel about it? Um, I've more often seen the combination of the tartans in a hand fasting cord where you take some leftover tartan or even a ribbon that's in the right tartan if you're lucky and you can find it um, and braid it together or, or twist it together into a cord for doing the hand fasting. That's what I've most often seen for that. Um, I think having it flipping over like an Othello chip would be kind of weird, kind of amusing. Um, you like that? <laughs> um, I don't know. If it were me... With the people I know and the Celtic women I've known in my life, they'd want to have their own tartan. Bottom line is they would want to represent their family, you know, because more of an equality kind of a thing, you know. So um, I would say it's it's up to the bride. You know, there's no wrong answer in this day and age. So um, do what will make the parents happy if you're so moved to do so, because I think that can be very important and very, very nice touchy-feely kind of a thing for them. Um because honestly, weddings are for you, but they're also for your family a lot of the time. So, yeah, it, don't don't upset anybody. Let's let's put it that way. Hmm. Would there be any? I'm trying to think to the the symbolism of again. This is all like old timey kind of symbolism. But when the when the father brings the bride down the aisle and you know hands her you know gives her away to the guy, mm-hmm. is there a symbol that we can incorporate there with the father giving something to the new son-in-law? Um, uh, maybe he gives him uh, something in his clan tartan, and then the, and then the bride wears the the new tartan. You can invent it, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's um, that again. Like I've like I've said, the uh, the hand fasting cord usually is where people tend to put that. Yeah, because it's um, it's the combining of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Ian, did you have a point? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to weigh in on this one. I think some people, despite what you're saying, might like the idea of wearing in hers and you know leaving the ceremony with his. It'll work for some people; it won't for others. Yeah. Um, and if if the symbolism of that, you know, losing your clan is, is something that's of concern, maybe there's a way that they could trade items. You know, she could take the new sash. Maybe she puts like a boutonniere, like in in with her, in the, with her, with her tartan, tartan on his yeah. jacket. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as mm-hmm. as a way to like you know we're not we're not giving up our clanhood for another's we're we're, we're sharing clans. both yeah mm-hmm. uh, maybe that's not the best way to do it but it's a way to think about it at least and come up with some fresh ideas yeah we're playing with the idea of clan very loosely we're really yes. talking about families in the modern sense and in the present tense you know yeah. the people who are alive and sitting here in this church um, if you're people- talking about clan and the tradition of the clan she would be joining that family so that's it. So then it would be all about yeah. his family tartan. It's easy to overthink the symbolism here, though. <laughs> but that's what you do for a yeah. wedding, Ian. Sure. You always overthink the symbolism. Sure. Yeah. And Fair I, enough. But to that point, um, A, it, it is a beautiful thing filled with a ton of different symbolism. So it really, it's talk to, you know, it's between the two of you what actually matters in that moment, especially if you mm-hmm. guys are the ones paying for it. Um, that said, don't get caught up in the details. I mean, it's 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 really for the it's the it's the symbolism that you're going to show in that moment. Um, but the things that will live on, unless you're having a videographer there to record the entire freaking thing, the things that will really live on and be passed down are the photos, are the wedding book. Is you know, it's that kind of thing. So having you know, prioritizing those and prioritizing those you know, you know, captured moments versus. The, the, the whole procession and all the things that are involved is really what matters more. Mm-hmm. So, but, but don't get, don't get caught up. If, if you want to do, you know, Hey, you should wear my tartan to the wedding. And she says, no, I want to wear my clan tartan. Don't make a thing out of it. It's don't start the marriage off with, you know, fighting about that kind of thing. With a blood it's, feud. <laughs> yeah, indeed. It's, 
it's you know your your love for each other and your accepting of each other's you know families and all that. That's really what matters more in the moment than mm -hmm. which which sash you're wearing at the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very good. All right, Eric. Hey, we'll do one more, then we'll do our mid show our, our mid show thing. Video. Okay, indeed. All right, Matt Horn. Hi, Matt. Says uh, my girlfriend and I are traveling to Scotland in the fall. I'm definitely going to bring a tailored kilt or two with me, but I was also wondering about taking a great kilt. I know kilts aren't often worn daily and are usually worn by tourists. Would a great kilt look a little too trying too hard? A la, oh, look at the American who watched Outlander and thinks he's Jamie Frazier. Or would it get more or less the same reaction as a modern tailored kilt? <clears throat> or something completely different? Sure. Should you wear a great kilt on vacation to Scotland? I on vacation to Scotland. Um, the 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 way that the general public uh, is going to interpret your your dress when you're wearing either a great kilt or a regular kilt in the in diaspora countries. So let's say you know America, Canada, Australia, Germany, South Africa, those kind of things versus Scotland is going to be very different. It's going to be perceived differently. If you are in South Africa or you're in America wearing a kilt, when someone comes across you, their immediate reaction is going to be, oh, that guy must have Scottish heritage. Um, or if you're wearing a great kilt, oh, that guy must be doing a reenactment of some kind. They may you know, equi equate it in that way. If you're in Scotland, it's either going to be, oh, that's a tourist who's, you know, expressing their heritage or, you know, they're, or they're a tour guide who happens to be giving an Outlander tour. Um, so it depends on where you are, how you're going to be perceived. If you are in Scotland and you want to be perceived in that way, and I'm thinking great kilt being worn in a traditional great kilt manner, not in like a contemporary t-shirt manner. Although okay. We can talk about that as yeah, well. Yeah, I think that... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I would say that it's you're you're going to have you, you have to be OK with being perceived as a tourist or someone who's, you know, just, you know, having fun with it in a particular way. Um, Eric, what are your thoughts while I continue to hone mine? Yeah, my thoughts are not going to be too different. I'm sorry. Um, I do think despite the statistics i do think that there are more guys wearing kilts in scotland now as enthusiasts shall we say um we've always known a few like like our old friend jock scott you know who's one of the old timers yep. on the uh, the old x marks the scott form um who do wear kilted attire highland attire tweeds and all in a very gentlemanly way that's their lifestyle but if you're walking around in edinburgh walking around in edinburgh yeah they're gonna think you're either a tourist or a tour guide, and as soon as you're up in your mouth, and they hear that that New Jersey accent of yours, they're gonna know you're not a tour guide. Um, and if you're wearing a great kilt, I think they're either gonna think you're they're gonna think you're a street performer or a street musician. Like uh, he, some of you guys know this, but the band Albanac was originally members of was it Clan Nandrama? Clan Nandrama, yeah. Clan Nandrama, who still perform, and they are a street performing band, and they get up there either with t-shirts or topless in great kilts and they go drum their drums and stuff and somebody's gonna just think like that yeah ex exactly like that <laughs> not disparaging them at all <laughs> um they're, they're gonna think okay that was that. disparaging <laughs> no that's just how i play the drums Fair. um so <laughs> big big monkey man to channel my specials yeah, I, I, yeah. I, 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 um no ska no ska no ska fight. today okay okay so um i don't recommend it i really don't i was trying to think about this and i thought maybe you could make an exception if you really just love wearing your great kilt maybe if you're doing a hill walk if you're going hiking in the wilderness and it doesn't matter what people are looking at and you just like like some of us do hiking in a kilt so we're just wearing you know a great kilt modernly for the comfort and all that then okay but if you're in the city I really don't, wouldn't do it, but <clears throat> consider the source. I, 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 if I'm going to go to Edinburgh, it's very likely I'm going to be in tweeds and a tie the whole time. Okay, I, I, I would have a hard time, especially if I went representing our company. 
I would have a really hard time dressing down. That's just the way I am, okay? Um, but if I were out in the evening clubbing, if I was out in the rural areas hiking or something, I, I think that's there's a lot more room to move there. So you know what I mean? I, you could take it, but I'd really think about how you're feeling that day and what the crowd you're going to be encountering is like that day. I, and you got to be on, man. You got to be oh, prepared yeah, yeah. for a lot of attention and a lot of reactions. You got to be prepared to perform if yeah. you're going to do this. I I would also say it depends on your your reason and your 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 thoughts on visiting a country. If um, when I when I go to Scotland or, or when you go to Scotland, are you going to visit historical sites of your ancestors or are you going to do that plus visit current day Scottish sites? Are you trying to get a sense of what their current day culture is or is it a history tour? How, which lens you know, right. do you have on? If I'm, if I'm going to Scotland to a trade show and I want to find the, the coolest restaurant in Inverness, or if I want to find you know, the best, you know, hipstery bar in, in Oban or Fort William or wherever I'm going, um, I'm, you will stick out like a sore thumb and get, you know, kind of like weird looks from people to, or not necessarily weird looks, but you're going to get looks from people because you are dressed different. Um, when I would go, I would want to, like I always say, if you go to a hotel, ask the people who live there, where do the locals go? Don't tell me what the tourist places are. I don't want to see the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. I want to know the coolest, you know, the coolest bar in the, in a weird part of the city where people don't go. It's only where the locals go. That's what I want to experience. Those are the, the moments that I want to have is seeing that or when you go to when you went to ireland to Doolin, where's where's the best you know what where's the best traditional session music night tonight where where should i go to see that not downtown shopping district thing yeah. necessarily there's or or the or if you want to go to the history and see the history stuff then that's fine too um that said if you wear kilts every day so i'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth here if you wear kilts every single day, if you wear a great kilt, if you're Jonathan Kennedy and you wear it in a contemporary way with a t-shirt and specific style of boots, and it's just your vibe, that's who you are as a human, then sure, do it. Um, no one is going to yeah. you know, lambast you and kick you out of the country for doing it. You're just going to get a the same amount of attention you probably get here in the States or there in Canada or wherever, over there, but they are going to be seeing it through a different lens than the people in your hometown do. The people mm -hmm. in your hometown are going to say, okay, you're doing this for this reason, or he must be Scottish or have Scottish heritage. Over there, they're going to think of you in a different way. And it's just specifically in Scotland. So mm -hmm. they're going to be thinking of you in a different way. So it's just understanding that they are going to see it in a diff through a different lens than people in your location do. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you just touched on one other factor worth mentioning or, or worth putting a point on is um, a subculture identity. Mm -hmm. If you're wearing that gray kilt or that kilt and you're, you've are you got full sleeve tattoos and you're wearing a muscle shirt and you got funky hair and you got earrings. Hi, John, talking about you. Um, people are going to assume it's some kind of an art artist subculture, probably heavy metal <laughs> kind of kind of a vibe. Yeah. You know, you are an individualist and yeah. Yeah, so... You may get that, in which case they're just going to look at you like they would any any other punk in some kind of subcultural gear. Um, if you wear your typical tourist, uh, casual, don't care if it gets wrinkled in a suitcase t-shirt and your hiking sneakers, you know, and your 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 boonie hat because <laughs> you don't want to get a sunburn, um, that's going to send a different message. Um, context is king. I would say you could bring it, but I would make it the least of the things you worry about packing because I think it'd be more trouble than it's worth personally. I think tailored kilts are going to be a lot easier to deal with in a lot of ways. So I agree. Good point. But if you do it, show us the pictures. Yeah. Cheers. All right. Now, for those of you who know, you know. For those of you who don't know, we're about to show you. Mm -hmm. um, we recently launched our America 250 collection, and our first tartan out of that collection was the E Pluribus Unum tartan, um, celebrating unity, and we did a whole video on that, and we're gonna play that for you now. E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. 
This concept cemented our path as a nation and brought 13 separate colonies into one union. Through the blood, sweat, and tears of the early Americans, ideas like individualism, religious tolerance, and liberty were forged into action. And when revolution came, join or die became a rallying cry. The founders knew that only by working together would there be a chance for the great American experiment to succeed. And so we begin our America 250 collection by honoring this idea of unity. The E Pluribus Unum Tartan begins with a single white stripe, the noble ideals upon which this country was founded. The white stripe is surrounded by 56 Navy threads for the 56 signatures on the Declaration of Independence. There are 13 stripes in the transition to symbolize the original 13 colonies forming one nation. A single red line represents the blood shed in the fight for American independence. Navy blue and tan incorporate the colors of the uniform worn by the Continental Army. And lastly, the light blue and the dark blue sections are balanced to represent the equality of all Americans. E Pluribus Unum. We choose to embrace this principle. The concept of unity has inspired generations of Americans with pride and with purpose. We might disagree with our neighbor, but in the end, we are all Americans. The beating heart of our republic is found in that place where regular people find a middle path forward. It's the mechanism that still drives this great experiment of ours. We're very proud of this design. And we hope you find its meaning inspiring. Join us as we begin our journey celebrating the rich tapestry of America by uniting as one. So that is our E Pluribus Unum Tartan, um, a tartan to celebrate, uh, to kick off our America 250 collection and to celebrate all the the good things that we have in common and the the unity that we should have as a nation so indeed mm -hmm. the uh i hope you guys are inspired a bit by that um it was uh yeah it kind of it started out it's it's life uh so to speak as our founding fathers tartan and then as we kind of further got into it there was a a, a bigger story that we wanted to tell because E Pluribus Unum was in was in the story for the founding fathers and how how different they were um, in their own beliefs and having to come together and that was in some ways that was the first you know compromise that had to be made as a country as a nation was you had to come together and say okay I don't agree with everything that you want but we have a common enemy we have a common goal we have to come together first because if we can't do that, we're done. We're, we're dead, all of us. Um, so that was the uh, uh, the original the original compromise, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and when we when we started really thinking about all the symbolism that we wanted to go into with this tartan, um, it it really became more about that and telling the story of of the nation and kicking off this whole collection with a, a tartan to represent unity, not just the story of the founding fathers, which is obviously a very pivotal moment in the country, but telling that story and how it still applies today. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember one of the things that, uh, one of the thoughts that I think hit, hit me when you were working on it was, we were talking about getting past the founding fathers thing was the fact that we are big fans of the founding fathers and, and as important as what they did was there were a lot of unsung heroes from all walks of life and all levels of society who were involved in the revolution as well so the idea that this was a movement of the people um not just not just not just not the just intelligentsia the or, yeah. yeah um so that was that was a big deal for us because we wanted it to feel like it is an everyman tartan in a sense you know yeah. it's something that everybody has a right to that heritage of this country is something that we all have a right to so so i thought that was uh, a yeah. strong element and the we, there was even thoughts beyond um the the symbolism that we included in there like we had thoughts about you know the three shades of blue for the three branches of government mm -hmm. um we had, we wanted to include the tan not only for the uh uh 
uh, uh, for the, the colors in the colonial uniform, but also for the parchment paper on which the declaration was written. Yeah. So there was there was a lot more. We didn't want to go have people think we're, you know, too, too artistic and crazy <laughs> with all the 987 right. different reasons and rationales of why we're including all these different things. But um, it's all of that stuff is it's just boiled and boiled boiled down mm -hmm. um and uh i remember originally there was there was a lot more in one of the earlier incarnations of the uh of the tartan there was a lot more tan um, yep. kind of the balance yep. of the uniform but as it evolved into more of a a unity tartan and less about the founding fathers less about the you know the the soldiers and more about the the country and the and the founding principles of the country um, I, I dialed back the, the tan mm -hmm. a lot yep. and, and kind of went with the, the two shades of blue mm -hmm. as the, as the meat, so mm -hmm. to speak. So like, what was there like seven or eight different versions of this? Oh, at least. At least. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot. Yeah. I it go, was I go through a lot of renditions before I mm -hmm. finally settle on something, mm -hmm. but it's, yeah. What's, what's your, your favorite line? No, no project is ever. Completed, just abandoned. Yes, that's yes. the old line from the world of writers. You know, no, no project is ever finished, only abandoned. So, yes. um, yeah, I think the, the and the trick was to make it elegant. You know, try and come up with a tartan which is not generically America, red, white, and blue. Yeah, you know, that's always our watchword: is to you know, how can we make this fresh for people and still meaningful? So, I like it. I yeah. like it a lot. And different than what is out there and things mm -hmm. that haven't been done or touched on before or areas that haven't been explored. Mm -hmm. So, But with newness... <clears throat> come questions. Come questions. And so I'm going to... I'm hoping we have some comments out, out there we can discuss or questions people are asking now. But one of the main ones we've gotten, uh, which was crystallized by Scott Smith on the Kilson Culture Facebook group, uh, saying, I've seen the E Pluribus Unum Tartan. I'm wondering how to pleat it. I thought about pleating it to the set, but I'm also considering <clears throat> pleating to the red stripe. How would you plead it and why? And wasn't there something about like he was, uh, was he a Marine or something like that? He had a reason yeah. why he wanted to do the red. Yeah. And I have heard more than one comment saying that this would probably be a good tartan in terms of like the dress blues vibe yeah. of the Marine yeah. Corps, I think, and, which hadn't occurred to me at the time when we designed it. I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And one of the other comments in that, in that uh, <clears throat> you know, post were about the designing of it and why we choose certain elements or don't choose certain or make things a certain size or not. Mm -hmm. um, so the he was asking about pleading it to the red stripe. So Adam, if you could pull up on screen the the image of the Tartan Air Force, the um, <clears throat> the red stripe is a notice it's a little bit wider than the white stripe. So when you're when you're pleading it to the red stripe. And the tan on the outside, then that you know thin blue guard, and then the the the, the lighter blue section. Um, if you imagine that being pleated on every single pleat, it would, if there's a a big taper to the back of the kilt. So if the guy has or the or the girl has a let's say an eight or ten inch difference between the waist measurement and the hip measurement, each individual pleat is going to taper a good amount. And if the bottom of the pleat, the bottom of the fill is like three quarters of an inch or an inch wide at the bottom of the hill, 0.9 inches, whatever it is, it's going to have the blue section on either side of that red stripe and the tan stripes. As you get up towards the top and those pleats start tapering down at the waistband, you'll start losing some of that blue. And if it's a if it's an aggressive taper, meaning it's a, it's a big waist to hip uh, difference, then you may end up losing the blue three quarters of the way up and you're going to end up with blue spikes going up in the back. So I would say it could potentially be pleated to the red stripe, um, but it's uh, it would be ideal it, on something like a box pleat or you know something where it's a, a wider pleat, a one and a half, two mm -hmm. inch two inch wide pleat mm -hmm. where you have plenty of room on either side of that red stripe. Um, I think that would look you know, pretty darn good. Um, as a as a designer, when, when I was designing the tartan, one of the things or any tartan that we design, if we want it to have a, to be able to be pleated this stripe, there'll be a very high contrast, strong, singular element. So in, in the E Pluribus Unum tartan, my thought was, you know, okay, have a white stripe um, and then in a navy blue field. So the lightest and the darkest element in the design 
have those, you know, right next to each other or, you know, the white stripe in the blue field. That way you can, if you pleat it to that particular stripe, it really, really pops. It really stands out. So a lot of, a lot of my designs, somebody kind of joked like, oh, there's the signature Rocky white stripe. And I never thought about it in that way. But yes, a lot of my designs have a strong white stripe um, in a, in a, uh, a darker area. So it's easy to pleat to a particular thing. Um, Ian, do you have any thoughts on pleating it? Yeah, so that, that was an interesting uh, comment from the original questioner because I, I definitely think of the white stripe first for yeah. pleating, but I could see that one working to the red. Yeah. I am generally a pleat to the set kind of guy anyway. That's kind of my go-to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I often explain that. I remember explaining this to a couple different people who do custom weaves with us recently who are contemplating this question. I'm like, you, you chose all the colors. <laughs> right. Maybe even you paid for a, a custom dye for one of those colors. Show them all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let mm -hmm. them all sing. I mean, you do always see everything in the horizontal part of the, the pleats, but if you lose it in the vertical... You know, yeah, it can be good. It can be bad, but I don't know. Just let, let them all, let them all sing. Let it all hang out. It's a, exactly. it's a, it's a chorus. Don't have, don't just have a soloist. Mm, I see. Perform the whole I way across. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Mm. Indeed. That's my mm. preference. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm, I generally fall where you do on that. I used to, I used to like the stripe more just to give, uh, you know, the front of the kilt and the back of the kilt have a completely different look to them. So it's, it's almost like two garments in one, if you're gonna make, or two tartans in one, if you're gonna make that argument, that could be made. Yeah. Um, but uh, the the more I wear kilts, the more I've kind of started leaning towards towards the set, like Ian there. Yeah. Do you have a preference, set or stripe? I'm always a set person. Okay. I, I don't tend to go for bleed to the stripe, if I can help it. If you can help as it. A, as a general, yeah. well, let's face it, a couple of my kilts I inherited from you. Oh, yeah. fair, <laughs> fair. So I'm not going to give, I'm not going to, well, it's pleated to the stripe. I'm not sure I really want it. No, but uh, no, with anything I've done, if I have the option, I will go to the set. Fair. So. Cool. And that, that, that lightning bolt thing you're talking about does concern me. Because I think, yeah, I think that it, it really would depend on your uh, hip to waist ratio, like you said. Yeah. Indeed. So. Very good. Ian. Yes. Um. <clears throat> Andrew comes Cooper. back like Bane. He's like, yes. Oh, I was born in the town. You've merely adopted it. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Cooper asks, with the Olympics coming up soon, do you think the Highland Games will ever be an Olympic sport? What is the best way to make this happen? Which particular... Which Highland Games? Yeah, which, which particular Ooh, event that? in the Highland Games? Um... <sighs> Do I think? Do I think, or do I wish? Those are two separate questions. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. said um, think, but yeah. yes. Do I think? No. no. It could be potentially kind of shoehorned into some track and field stuff. Right. Like the stone throw is essentially it's a shot put with a rock right. as opposed to a metal right. ball. Um, I think. Yeah. The only the only one that's really unique, like that, would not be just mimicking something that's already an event. Is caber toss? Is caber yeah. toss, or maybe the Denny Stones? You but, know? Yeah, but Denny Stones aren't a, you know, Highland Games. Well, specific. they're in a lot of Highland games now. Really? That, okay. Yeah, like you mean like taking the big stone and lifting it onto the barrels? That's... I thought the Denny stones were the two stones that they oh, the had Denny to stones, hold up. the the that's the lift. Yes, that's like the deadlifting. Lift okay, and so hold. what's the one where yeah. you're putting the the stone on top of the barrel? Yes. Yes, that one. Yes. But if you're going to introduce anything, I think it'd have to be caber. Yeah. Because it's unique. It's not crossing the streams. Yes, but it would have to be. They would have to have enough athletes in each country. Mm -hmm. Or at least some athletes in each country that like doing Highland Games. So it would really only be the countries that have Highland Games. So like Germany, Australia, New Zealand, uh, America, Canada, Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, that's really where the athletes would come from. So is there a Eventually. broad enough appeal? I'm not on the Olympic Committee. However, mm -hmm. um, I would have to think, would there be a broad enough appeal for a particular event um, to get enough athletes to compete <laughs> to have it be actually competitive i have another idea what if you did what if you had uh olympic tug of war and okay. and all the members of the national team against all the other members of the other national team okay so you have a tug of war that spreads across the entire field with okay. like 30 people on either end of the rope hmm. Hmm. maybe that's an after party thing though. maybe it's not an official event yes and they'd have to wear kilts of course yes indeed hmm yeah i don't know that's an interesting thought but yeah, but, it, uh, but what 
what so you know we have the sheath toss yeah um, what other well that's events? different enough that's different yeah. enough yeah i'm trying to think what other events could be an olympic sport um i think it's got to be caber that's the one that everyone goes to see right. everyone wants right. to see it's the most you know visually jarring like holy that dude's throwing a telephone pole right um right. yeah so it, it would almost have to be caber mm -hmm. but I mean, never say never. I mean, it was isn't there like in the Winter Olympics? Isn't like snowboarding? Yeah. Is there a snowboarding? Yeah. So, yeah. so there is room for new. It's a sports. winter sport at the Winter Olympics, though. So yeah. yes, those do skew towards northern countries. Right. But yeah. um, for natural reasons. Jamaica bobsledding. Come on. Yeah. Where did these guys come from? Jamaica! Yeah, I think yeah. I think the national thing. It's it's would you have enough people to have an interest in it. I, I guess you yeah. don't you don't have to enter an athlete in every single true yeah qualifier right? no you don't no yeah, so i think where i would look to is that there's there's lots of interesting national sports throughout the world that are unique to one country mm -hmm. um and you don't see a lot of that at the olympics sure karate is pretty specific but it's been adopted in so many places yeah throughout the i think world that's the thing in a way that yeah. um highland games have not necessarily so the yeah. So here, here's what here's what we need to do. Hmm. We have a a non-Olympic. We have a national Olympic um, thing where you take a sports that are very very country specific, uh -huh. and you make those the ones that are just for this new thing. Hmm. So you do have the caber toss. You do have lawn darts. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> Like there's a dart in your head. God okay. damn it. Is, can't think of it. Okay. Like American football. Or so, you have, you know, you have specific sports that are very, very country related. Yeah. You have Russian nesting dolls. That can, <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to fit inside what? people. I don't know. I, 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 I'm, I'm getting on board with this idea. So you're taking like a team from Scotland who does Highland Games and a team from, you know, India that does a very particular Cricket type of wrestling. or something. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take a, yeah. Take a team from Brazil that does a very particular High type liars. of jiu-jitsu. Yeah, yeah. And oh, you know, yeah. from the Philippines that do that like rowing sport I don't quite well, understand. Yeah. And like do they all compete against each other at each other's sports? That could be fun. Either, either that or it's – or the, yeah, they all compete, but it's not like – it's not like a roundhouse like yeah. the show you were talking about. I'm thinking mm -hmm. the more yeah. like you get the best, you know, caber tosser from every country yeah. and then or the best, you know, top three or whatever it is from each country. Yeah. And then you have okay. the qualifying. It's it's set up like the Olympics, but it's just uh -huh. national sports okay. and then from countries all around the world. Mm -hmm. So if there is no caber tossers in Thailand, yeah. then or the or the caber tossers that are in Thailand didn't qualify then okay fine they're not in that event just like in the olympics so it's very very competitive but you may have more caber tossers from scotland and north america where there's going to be more of those types of things hmm. Hmm. but i want to see more more athletes more cross-pollination of different like sports you don't know about you just want to get away from the whole greek thing is that it well, javelin and shot put and all the I'm, no, I'm fine with those, with but Greek those stuff. are those are in uh, those are already established yeah. sports. Right. I want to see right. weird, obscure sports from you know this you know the from Nicaragua, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. or you know a particular you know tribe from the Brazilian rainforest, like something mm -hmm. something you don't mm -hmm. have in you know in the U.S. or in mm -hmm. Greece or mm -hmm. in wherever Australian no. crocodile wrestling. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yes. Got it. That's what I, I want. What it's is this show about again? Want. Exactly. <laughs> it's about high on athletics and stuff. Yeah. I yeah. So anyway, thanks. Caber toss. Have Indeed. to be caber toss. Indeed. Has to be caber toss. All right. Oh, oh, wait. What if the caber is the torch? Ooh. And you have to flip the flaming, flaming caber into caber the thing torch? to light the torch on fire. Heck yeah. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Try running ten miles with that. <laughs> I'm no See now, ah, oh, damn it! I, now I want to have the sheaf toss with like a flaming bale. Yes, that you have to flick yes. over the bar. See, everything is better thing. on fire. That's yes. the bottom and stones line. you throw, but they're on fire. Yes, you hold it right here. <laughs> Scottish yeah. sword dancing, but the swords are on fire. <laughs> Hear me out. Hear me out. <laughs> bagpipe bands on fire. But there are some bagpipe bands that should be on fire. Uh, <laughs> shooting flames. Yes. That's been done. Yes. Mm -hmm. Australian Piper guy. Oh, my gosh. Caper Relay. <laughs> Caper. Caper. 
<laughs> Here, catch. No, you have the caber toss and the caber catch. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right we're, we're off the rails okay boy are well it's ian's I, fault i blame yes. whoever asked the question <laughs> meanwhile back in the real world um gene smith says i'm wondering how i might choose my next tartan since i am a smith i have smith kilts already however my direct to scotland lineage includes anderson duncan gordon wilson oliphant and more Plus, my wife is a McCallum Buchanan, so I could theoretically honor her family also. He's got too many choices, is what he's worried about. Fair. Should I limit myself to the Tartans based on my father's side or my mother's side? Or can I honor my wife's family? Or could I just go rogue and just get what I like? What is the usual and customary rule that most guys go by? So what is the what do most guys do? And then work backwards from there. Sure. So. The... Um, what do most people do? How do they pick their tartan? Or their um, second tartan. Or the second or third or fourth or 27th. Yeah. Um, I would say most people start with, if you're coming at it from a heritage angle, let's start with that supposition. Mm -hmm. So if you're coming at it from a heritage angle, most guys will, or gals, will pick their family tartan. So they'll pick their, generally speaking, paternal side. Sometimes they do maternal side, but they start down that branch. Um, if their last name happens to be Gordon or something with a particular tartan, then a lot of people will pick that actual tartan. Um, you don't have to, though. If you're a Buchanan, but you're also a McDonald on your grandmother's side, then, and you just really, really don't like the Buchanan tartan, you're, it's, you're just not a fan of it for whatever reason, then sure, you can happily pick the McDonald tartan as well. There's no hard and fast rule saying you must express your heritage this way it's it's your heritage it's your life it's yours to express in the way you want to express it it's your clothing so it's clothing with meaning but it is your decision and it's your clothing so if you have you know more than one frankly speaking you have option if you only have one you still probably have options because you can pick ancient modern or weathered or muted right um but if you have multiple tartans you can pick then I would say either pick the part of your family or the, the branch of your family that you are closest to and go that direction. If you want to, you know, get a second kilt, then great. Maybe you, you know, pick a secondary tartan from a different branch of the family. <clears throat> or if you're married, maybe you wear your wife's tartan because, you know, you want to honor her side of the family. If you just love, you know, uh, you love America, maybe you pick the American dream tartan. If you love you know, uh, wilderness, you pick a universal, you know, tartan from House of Edgar that they're doing and they're, they're marled yarns. There are, di or if you've been to the Isle of Skye and you had a wonderful time there, maybe you wear the Isle of Skye tartan. You can wear different tartans to honor your heritage. It doesn't have to be a direct line. My last name is Gordon, so I'm wearing the Gordon tartan. That's the only thing I will wear. You can do that if you want to. That is 100% a viable way to do it. But don't put yourself in a box. Don't tie your hands before you make the, the decision. Mm -hmm. You may want to start that way, but it doesn't have to stay there if you want to wear something different. Yep. I'm, I'm sure there are guys out there who admire all kinds of tartans and think they're all beautiful, but still decide to only wear their clan tartan. And they just, maybe they have other objects in other tartan because they love it. If that's you, I admire your discipline. <laughs> I could not possibly do that. I like, I'm a magpie. I like shiny things. So, you know, um, yeah, there's really no hard, fast rule about this. I think definitely most people start off with um, a clan tartan if they're coming from the heritage standpoint. I'm from the opposite perspective. I, I came from the fashion side of things. My first kilt I ever owned was black, just shadow, shadow weave black. And then I got into the heritage stuff later. Um, and I'm much better now. But the, um, but the, really, especially if you're talking about your second tartan, or third or whatever um there's no rule and there's other factors you can consider that rocky you didn't mention like you could decide that for formal occasions you want something really bright that's going to look in the low light of the ballroom or the place where you guys go for your for your 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 burn theater supper or, whatever, yeah. or your burn supper your you know your saint andrew's dinner um things like that you want something that just really pops in 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 low light or 
you might decide you want to go seasonal and have something that really feels fall to you for the fall and something that feels more light and springy you know for the spring or for summer you know something that just feels less heavy you know so there's 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 colors um very abstract things like that not just the familial connections and the uh the social connections so there there's any number of ways to to choose it so i wouldn't worry about it stretch yeah. out with your feelings yeah there there's no wrong way to express your heritage well there are wrong ways okay <laughs> there there are some wrong ways um but it's there's there's no wrong tartan to pick so it's, you know, whether you want to be connected to it or not, whether you want to have only a particular, you know, either color palette or a particular, you know, just your clan tartans, or if you want to branch out in different things, or if you want to start with a, a, a non-clan tartan universal one, that's a less expensive one, but you're going to save up and get your clan tartan for the formal stuff. So you have the sure. nicest kilts to wear for that. Mm -hmm. So there, there are different ways to come at it, depending on where you are in this journey. It's the journey of your heritage and the journey of life. It's and your and your finances. It's all very, very much a personal thing. If you don't have a lot of money and you want to start with the lower end to see if you like it, and then you work your way up, great. Um, so it's all it's it's all depending on what you want to do and how you want to go at it. There's no wrong answer. There's no wrong way to do it. Just yeah, start. Nothing hard and fast. Exactly. Yeah. So, he, and he's coming from the opposite perspective because because he already has his Smith Clan Tartan. Yep. But yeah, if you are uh, on a budget, like you said, or timid about getting started in this stuff, and you have an obscure clan, and you're only going to be able to get it as a custom weave, or it's going to be ex more expensive, you know, because you, you, it's only available in 16 ounce wool, and what you have right now is a PV budget, then yeah, start with that. And then save up for the clan. I think that's a good point. It's kind of the, the switcheroo of what he's dealing with. But yeah, yeah, no wrong answer. Yeah, but if you're already have one and you're looking for your second one, odds are, chances are, you're like us, and it's kind of like potato chips. You can't just have just one. Right. And you're gonna like if you're and if you're watching this show, frankly, you, you probably care enough in the, about this stuff and you nerd out about it just the same way we do. So you're gonna end up with. Not necessarily a closet full of 40 kilts plus, but you're going to have more than one. So I would say start with the ones that you're, you know, obviously you already have the Smith one, but you're going to have two, three, four, and kind of explore different ways within it. And another way to, you know, keep it budget friendly is if you have one that you don't wear as much, but there's a new one over here that you really fell in love with, maybe sell this one off to be able to purchase that one. Yep. So yeah, there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat, but where the cat's skin i don't know i got really and weird. use a glove indeed yes but cheers and enjoy your heritage enjoy expressing your heritage however you do it just have fun with it guys cool all right mr ian so i've got a question here from gleons one if an organization wanted to develop a tartan for multiple media and materials what would the timeline look like for design and then the weaving timeline an organization media and materials yeah media and materials so you mean like printing it on plastic as well as a poly viscose kilt as well as a wool kilt is that what we're talking potentially he was not overly he or she was not overly specific okay yeah <clears throat> the the timeline to develop a tartan um is as long or as short <laughs> as you want to make it um, sort of yes i agree um the so to design it in 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 print um, it could be an hour. Like you could literally just use our tartan designer on our website and have a design mocked up in an hour. I don't suggest you design a tartan really quickly and then say, yep, cool. Everybody like it? Yep, we're done. Excellent. That's going to be the tartan. Um, <laughs> I always, 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 always suggest you design it and then save it, put it to the side. Then start from scratch, design something different. Maybe use the same colors, um, if, especially if they're corporate or branded colors, um, but design something very, very different. And then show it to a couple different people. Or save a few different tartans and then stop, sit on it, walk away for a few days, and then come back to it. And then see if you like it the same amount that you did when you stopped the process. Um, so there, there's that level of it. Then when you go to the mills to have something woven, it depends on the mill. Some mills are a you know seven or eight week turnaround time for weaving things. Other mills are a 16, 20 week turnaround time for weaving things. 
So it depends on the mill that you are going to. And then there's whatever you're physically making out of the stuff. If you're making kilts or sashes or, you know, scarves or whatever else it is, uh, there's, there's that time that has to be involved in the process as well. If it's for print for marketing materials, that's pretty quick and easy. Yeah, once you have um, it. Once you have it, you have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. It's basically, in, in a way, what's going to drag down the process is the most important factor, and that is making sure you have consensus in the organization that this is the design that you feel really represents you the best. Um, if you're talking about a small club or a small group, like, say, a household in the SCA, it might be easier said than done. Uh, if you're talking about a national organization or a network of axe throwing clubs or a team or something, that could take longer. Um, democracy is a very valuable thing, but it can also be a very slow thing. So make sure that you don't push yourself into a time frame that's going to get you frustrated with the people around you you're trying to design this with. Um, the averages for production of cloth, which is what we know the most, is exactly what Rocky was saying. So you can build that in at the end of your process, but make sure that you take the time at the beginning of the process and make sure you've definitely got everybody on board. That is that is absolutely key to make sure that it takes off. You know, Otherwise, you're stuck with a tartan that only a few people like, and you've invested maybe in these T-shirts or something, and nobody wants them. So I would, that's, I would my, also, that's my concern. Yep, and I would kind of jump off of that and say, there's a, there's a phrase, I love this phrase, called death by committee. Right. So if you want nothing done, get a whole bunch of new people, a room, people into a room with a hundred different opinions and nothing will ever get done. So what I would generally speaking say works, what I have found works the best, whether it's a bagpipe band that comes to us or a corporation or whatever it is, and they want to design a tartan for their group. What I say is, okay, pick three people mm -hmm. to kind of spearhead the project. So Three, the most creative, the most in-depth, the, mo or the most involved, or whoever it is, three people that really, really want to see this thing over the finish line and get them involved in the process. And then go to either, you know, either one of, you know, vote one of them as the designer or, you know, hire a tartan designer like us or somebody else and say, okay, here's the colors, here's the things we want, go. And then start going through the process of revising things. So let's say you pick John. John's your main guy. And then Steve and Sue. Um, so Steve, Sue, and John. And John's the guy designing it. Now, they go back and forth with the ideas and kind of go into the design of what they like and what they don't like. And they revise things over time. And then what I say is come up with two designs. No more, no less. And when you take it to the broader committee, if you're going to have to have this design you know brought in front of the board or in front of a group to have something approved take two if you bring three or four or six different designs you will never 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 get consensus mm -hmm. bring two and then it's a straight up or down vote which one do you like pick from these two that's it um, but make sure that you have two designs that as as the designers, as the as the group of three or whatever it is that are very involved in making sure that this project gets over the finish line, make sure that you have two strong designs that look different enough from each other to give you know people a firm opinion or allow people to have a firm opinion of I like this one because it's simpler or I like the complexity and the and the you know the the transitions in this one or whatever. But have two designs. Don't go with twenty-seven. Um, it's you're you're never gonna get a consensus. That's my my little tip in that area. There you go. Cool. Hope that helps. All right, Eric. <clears throat> Colton Cunningham uh, is wondering for the budget-minded among us. We know that five and eight-yard kilts can be flexed down into more casual wear, but could a casual kilt be flexed up? into more formal wear without the kilt police coming after us. Would the kilt police come after you for a, uh, a, a casual, casual kilt, kilt? In a semi-formal formal. Adam, I'm sorry for what I'm about to do to the microphone. Wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. Yes, we are coming for you. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I, I always hesitate to say that, you know, lower end casual kilts. I'm specifically thinking of our casual kilt or going to a broader thing like an acrylic, you know, kilt made in Whoa. Pakistan kind of Whoa. thing. Um, 
Not that ours and that are the same, but no. it's, but they're both casual and visually are looking more casual. Yes. Um, I would say that there's there's definitely a glass ceiling, or there's a ceiling somewhere in there that you you shouldn't go above, you know, period. Um, mm-hmm. For for me, it's me personally. I would say the ceiling that I would hit is a sweater. Um, I would I would pair a casual kilt with a with a nice pullover, a nice sweater, um, but that's essentially where I would stop. I wouldn't go. Now I I do have the luxury of having you know multiple kilts in the closet, um, but I wouldn't try to wear a casual kilt with a Prince Charlie jacket and vest. Mm. It would oh, no, it no. would look to me it just doesn't it doesn't look like it belongs with the rest of the mm-hmm. outfit. Mm-hmm. It's just it's not quite there. Yep. Thoughts? That yeah, you're reminding me of once we had we had a guy who came in and wanted to do exactly that, and we could not talk him out of it. He was, uh, as I recall, he was a, an, a funeral director or something from Reading, and he wanted to have an, an outfit ready for the weekend, and he decided that he had to have an Irish tartan, so he took a casual kilt off the rack, and he bought a, uh, all, he had money to burn, apparently, but not a lot of time, and he bought a Prince Charlie <clears throat> set and, and a nice spore and all that stuff, but he bought a casual kilt, and it looked horrible to my eye. Um, he was happy as a clam i trust he had a great time and wore it in good health but it just was it just looked wrong uh the drape was wrong the boxiness of more casual kilts does not go with the the silhouette of a tailored uh top half of an outfit it just doesn't work um so yeah i mean sorry i mean i get the problem but um i'd say you could probably go as far as like maybe a shirt and tie you know like shirt tie and vest just kind of like okay. kind of like going to the pub let's imagine let's imagine a nice night going to a pub with a date or some buddies you know then i think you could probably get away with that okay but anything where you have to have uh, a sense of dignity or gravitas or officialdom or anything like that it's just not going to work right yeah and because you, you because there, there's a, there's a lack of tailoring and lack of crispness yeah. and precision to the shaping of a casual kilt that once you put it next to something that's very well tailored like a Prince Charlie or a, a well-fitting tweed set, it's going to look wrong. I, w- so. I would say this. I'll, I'll, I'll hedge a little bit. I'll, I'll back off a little bit. If it is either all you can afford or if you're at an event where you're you're going to, let's say your, uh, your buddy is marrying and and uh, a woman with indian heritage and the the wedding is going to be you know indian themed Mm -hmm. um then okay like indian from india so it's like it's a lot of colors it's a lot of it's a lot of bright over the top you know a a big huge freaking party atmosphere lasts for three days the groom comes in on a white horse yep and and you're going to be the only guy in a kilt Mm -hmm. okay they're 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 not going to know odds are that okay, this isn't a a proper wool kilt. Da 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 da. Right. So you can you can get away with things. For me, I would feel a little more like uh, I should be wearing something a little bit a little bit fancier, a little bit dressed up for the thing. But you could get away with it. But that's kind of like the 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 line I'm going to underline there is you're getting away with it. It's not the right, right thing. Right. It's it's close enough. Mm-hmm. And if if you feel and and or especially if there's a time constraint like the guy you were you were mentioning earlier, mm-hmm. uh, if there's a time constraint and you have to just get away with it for for a particular event because you just don't have the time or you don't have the budget or whatever, that's fine. Then then do it. Um, but it's I would rather see, you know, moving up the scale a little bit, at least like a semi traditional kill or something with narrower pleats or a little bit, you know, the straps and buckles, something a little bit nicer. Yeah. Um, I've 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 never felt awkward being a little bit more overdressed than I have being a little bit underdressed. So that's mm-hmm. kind of the way that I I think about it. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Cool. Hope that helps. Tough love, man. Indeed. Tough love. Indeed. Ian. So from our friend Aaron Peabody up in the Pacific Northwest, he wants to know in your experience. What's something in the Highland Wear space that has been greatly improved by technological advances over the last 15 to 20 years 
and what's something that maybe has not improved or maybe could improve? A couple of answers to that, I think. I got a good one, and it's the same thing both ways. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, sporns. Okay. Sporns, in 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 my mind, laser etching sporns allows hmm. for whatever design you know, our little hearts you know, desire, um, and allows more customization and and a lower cost to entry. So if I said like when we when we first started like, playing around with designs like your uh, the Nordic sporn you have on there when we had our our lion logo on the sporn and I yeah. think that was actually the first one that they did yeah um, it's I said hey hey Greg I want this thing to exist and he's like cool just send me a drawing of it and I can just laser it on there boom done and I was like oh that's awesome so the flexibility to be able to do whatever we want to do with sporn designs is really really cool what i think you we have sacrificed is the the look the yeah the precision that no not precision but the beauty of hand tooled sporns and hand embossed sporns hmm. or debossed sporns hmm. where when you look okay. closely at a laser etched sporn it looks too perfect or you know you can see you know, the little lines okay. on it or it's 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 it looks like it's either, I won't say printed on, but it, you know, it's kind of printed on. It's well, lasered on. You can on. tell it's laser. Yes, you can tell it's lasered, and you lose the uh, the, the feel of something that's been you know hand tooled, hand stamped, and and mm -hmm. you know leather beaten into submission. Yeah. Um. So I still I have a very very soft spot in my heart for embossed leather sporins. I think it just it looks more artisanal, so to speak than laser etched mm -hmm. but the laser etched allows for such a broad Some more variety exactly such a broad spectrum of things but, to but do. you're yeah i mean you haven't really lost the embossing it's just it's a bit more niche and it's it's got a bit more expensive i think it's a now. lot more expensive yeah. cost so of entry is a lot more expensive yeah it can be so but in a sense a lot of this stuff did have a higher cost of entry back in the day there 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 there's definitely a time where you know if you were middle class or you know, blue collar class, and you wanted a kilt and a sporn, like we're I'm talking like the 50s through the 80s, mm -hmm. it was going to be kind of crappy, you know. Like the sporn was going to be a little more than a couple of pieces of you know leather and cardboard, and not really gusseted properly to hold anything. Even you know, there there was some low end stuff that was just utter crap back in the day, but it was perfectly acceptable because it was what most people could afford. Okay. Uh, okay. I I I'm, I disagree with. I've seen a lot of. Know. I've seen I've seen poor poor quality examples historical as well as current day. Yeah. So it still exists. I'm just saying I'm saying I think the higher quality stuff has become more affordable. Yeah. The nicer looking stuff. The technology has has allowed better quality, more durable stuff to become affordable. It's uh, yes or and or it's the the more variety because the the stamps that too the the cost of like the the one that I have on here this is an embossed sworn and flap mm -hmm. um and but it, you had more standard styles it was like okay I'll take the A6 sporin or the B12 sporin or whatever I don't know why I'm quoting vitamins but the uh, mm. um but it's you know this flap on this sporin is a very historical one it has mm. a moment in time classic. where this was a classic design exactly because the brass stamps that had to be carved for actually stamping the sporins was a higher cost to entry so a mm. sporin maker had let's say you know eight stamps and if i said okay well i want a different stamp then he would say okay fine but it's going to be several hundred dollars for you know for whatever just for the stamp to be able to do a sporin so it can't really just be a one-off mm -hmm. it had to be you know for unless you're you know ungodly rich um it had to be included well, in a brand new line yeah yeah are we kind of saying the same thing it, or am i confused no it's it's for individuals yes it would be you would have more of a generic uh, uh, mass-produced ones yeah. versus just not, and just not nearly yeah. as nice yeah. or expressive or as good a quality. I'm, I'm, it's hard for me to think of things I think we've lost. I think there's something that we've lost, which I think is kind of fun, and I would, I would, part of me wants to see come back is uh, I think it'd be fun to see more people wearing castellated hose. The, those are those are kind of cool and they're kind of silly, but I dig them. So I think it'd be fun if those came back. To, you know, I mean, there. I know there's a few of you guys out there, especially in the trad community, who who have them and, and like them, and 
more power to you because I think they're fun. But there's not a lot we've lost aside from our dignity, perhaps. But no, um, no. The the thing that I think the the biggest technological advance for my money is um, 3D printing and and from from CAD drawing to 3D modeling to 3D printing has made uh, such a huge impact on designing any metal goods, you know, buckles and sporns and skin do handles and all that stuff. There is so much cooler stuff you can do now uh, than back in the day for similar things we're talking about in terms of like, you know, time and effort and cost of entry and all that kind of stuff. But mm-hmm. it is it is possible to have so much of that stuff made now um, that even, you know, a, you know a smaller operation like us we can we can realistically consider what if we did a buckle with a skull and a shipwreck on it you know for for the for the welsh pirate community and we can actually consider that and have it made you know and that is freaking amazing that's that's the that's the biggest technical thing for me yeah so. i i agree now here's here's where i think it gets um i i love it and hate it again back to the technology the double-edged sword of technology mm-hmm. is if if I said okay, well, I want a kilt pin made in a three D printed thing. It's the quality of a three D printed item is less than a metal cast item, um, but it allows the development of products to be shortcut. It also allows um, yeah the 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 back and forth on a particular design, especially if you are not an artist in that way. If mm-hmm. I can sculpt something and send a piece of clay that I have sculpted to my pewter company over in the UK and say here cast this into a, into a kilt pin. Great. If I'm not, if then I have to rely on an artist to do that for me. And it's like, Hey, here's an idea that's in my brain, make it exist in real life. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of back and forth and back and forth Yeah. versus a, uh, something that's a 3d printed thing. It's you start off with a three dimensional drawing of the item. Right. And then it's kind of the back and forth on a 3d drawing, which is a lot easier to do. I think, I think um, that's, that's the trick. The, the, the 3d, uh, the 3D render, the 3D sculpt using a 3D printer is the starting point. And then a, a qualified artist will take that to the next level. But it, it is more efficient for them and easier for them. It's easier to get prototypes done. And you see, okay, well, that's how it looks in 3D printing. You know, sculpt that one. You know, fix those edges, smooth that out, bring this up a little more 3D by hand, and then you can really dial it in. Yeah. So I think that's, it's, it's a lot, the technology that I think is making the biggest difference as with any other industry, is really very much behind the scenes. So, and Yes, and I'll, I'll even keep springboarding off of that. The technology is only as good as the humans that are manipulating it. Mm-hmm. So the uh, when I when we did our American Eagle buckle, um, this is a, uh, we actually did this one as a 3D printed thing and then uh, had to go in with an artist and have them Activate play around cam. with it. So if you start... <laughs> <clears throat> if you start with and what we said for this one in talking to the artist and I'm, I'm using the word artist, even though he's just, you know, sitting behind a computer playing around with a 3D drawing, he still is an artist because they're the ability. And when I said, look, I want the, the wings to taper up. Don't just give me a flat thing and draw it out and laser around it. I want like the wings to taper from layer to layer to layer. I want this to feel like a three dimensional piece of art, not just a flat thing. So you're still looking for artisans within their craft. And whether it's AI, whether it's 3D printing, whether it's laser etching, it's you're still having to rely on the human's input of the of the data and getting it honed to make it a better thing than you are if you just have, you know, ah, well, my my you know, my cousin's boyfriend plays around with 3D printers. So I'll just have her do the thing. It's not just that. It's taking that and then kicking it up a notch to quote em- Emerald Lagasse. It's you have to still be an artist within it to make it something, you know, that's that people are going to want. I got this idea for Buckle that has like William Wallace fighting the Predator. <laughs> I'd buy that. <laughs> I know you would. <laughs> no, no, no. It's William Wallace in the middle. And he's, got, he's got an alien on the tip of one sword here and a, and a predator on the tip of his arm, and he's just like and they're both gory and dripping blood yeah <laughs> no we're not making that happen don't ask in the comments i'm gonna start my own company called nerd kilts <laughs> it'll be a sister company and we'll make all that shit fair fair 
Okay. All right. Um, let's do one more, and then we'll go over. Oh, did we? No, we didn't do our question of the day. Oh, all right. Then we're gonna have a question of the day. Dope. Okay. Dope. Okay. Um, hmm. Hmm. Dennis McEl uh, McLeroy. Sorry, Dennis McLeroy says for the two gurus. Where? <laughs> this. They're over We're, there. Yeah, they, they left. We'll, we'll handle the question, though. <laughs> um, this October at Stone Mountain Highland Games, uh, we will be meeting the new chieftain of Clan Grant. I would like to be properly attired for this occasion and am planning to dress as follows. Tweed jacket and waistcoat in Lovett Green. Uh, matching kill hose and tartan flashes. Button down white dress shirt. Matching tartan <laughs> necktie. Brown leather day sporn and brown gilly brogues. Do you think this is appropriate, or should I ramp it up a notch and wear my black semi formal sporn and black gilly brogues? It's at a Highland Games, it said? Correct. Okay. Stone Mountain. Sure. <clears throat> um I'm I'm on board with ninety eight well, frankly speaking, exactly what you said. Yeah. You'll be fine. Yeah. Um we're gonna give some nuanced opinions here within it, but if you wore that, you'll be fine. Um what I would, uh, the only one that I would, or two things that I'll take a little bit of issue with potentially um, would be the necktie. I don't know if, I, I'm not a fan myself of wearing a matching tartan necktie to the matching kilt. Um, so I would probably do something, either a club tie or an interesting um, mm -hmm. subtle pattern tie or a, or a single color necktie to maybe tone with your flashes or something like that. Um, so... I would probably do something a little bit different necktie wise um, for your shoes, brown gilly brogues, fine. Um, or if you want to even be a little bit more, you know, traditional day wear for lack of a better term, just a pair of brown wingtips. You don't have to wear gilly brogues. Um, yeah. Wingtips are just as acceptable, if not more so, for a day wear type outfit, smart shoe outfit, mm -hmm. um, or smart shoe option for an outfit. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the two where I would go, but I've I've seen you know in, in you know we got this question ahead of time, so we did look up um, the the new uh, uh, clan chief for Clan Grant, yeah. and there there's a few different photos of them wearing this you know almost type exactly of what you're yeah. describing, yeah, very similar yeah. outfit to that. So yeah. yes, and it's it's a day wear event, it's a daytime event, so I would not wear a black jacket and vest. I would not wear a semi-dress or semi-formal sporin. I would stick with day wear type accoutrement. I think you could do a semi-dress sporin, <clears throat> but we see so many people breaking what we have traditionally thought of as the conventions all the time. I see dress sporins at Highland Games. You know, people just do what they want to do. And I'm not talking just hoi polloi people either. I'm talking about you know, uh, not I'm talk, not talking about the plebs. I'm talking about you know people of rank also. Just um, that's what they want to wear because it makes them feel special that day, and so it's fine. Your heart is in the right place. Um, it's going to be fine. Your outfit is fine. Um, my comments are exactly the same as Rocky's. Personally, I would rather see a club tie. Um, I think the tartan tie is nice, but for me, it's a little too on the nosy. Um, and uh, again, the Gilly Brogues. You don't have to have them. I think brown is absolutely appropriate and even more appropriate for a Highland Games event, frankly. My only quibble is I would not do a button-down color. Uh, button-down dress shirts, dress shirts, uh, date back to around the turn of the century, like in the 1890s. And <clears throat> their exact origin is a tiny bit murky, but theoretically, you had people playing polo in England who were starting to go to their tailors and request that they have buttons put on their collars to prevent them from flying up in the wind while they were riding in a polo match. And uh, they were either homegrown in England or one story goes that there was an American shirt maker who was visiting England and heard about this and he decided to jump on it. Actually, it was the one of the guys who founded Brooks Brothers. I was going to say that. The, the Brooks, Oxford shirt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they have always been considered a casual thing frankly so if it were me i would use a true dress shirt not a button down that's my only critique my and only he, serious critique and when we say button down you're specifically referring to a collar not the buttons down no, 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 the no, front no, no. Of the that's shirt. not that's not a thing correct that, that's that's a button down is where 
You got the buttons here yep. and here. I'm like just that. putting it in, in, in layman's terms. When, he, when we're talking about button down, we're it's, not talking about yeah. a shirt that buttons all the way down. No. Um, no, because you have to open, like, here, to show your monthly chest. Um, it, now, it's basically, yeah, that, that shirt was always considered casual nice. It was very popular in the college scene. In fact, it became part of a style called Ivy League. Um, it's still it's still very much something you might wear at the Hamptons. Yes, know. lovely. Um, but I would not recommend it with the tweeds. I'm going to go a little a little more into the shirt thing here. Tattersall. Tattersall. Yep. Damn it. Yeah. Um, I would do Tattersall shirt or a or a window pane check kind of you know, a, a let's say centimeter or so window pane or Tattersall type shirt um, with a color that pulls out one of the colors in the kilt could even be a minor color in the kilt it just adds a little bit of a little bit more pattern in a very very traditional classy way yeah. um so if you're going to meet a clan chief and you can pull it off if if you don't know how to pull it off if you're uncomfortable with mixing tattersall or mixing patterns like a tattersall shirt with a with a tartan kilt then don't do it solid white solid light blue is fine um but if you are comfortable doing it then yes, a Tattersall shirt can look chef's kiss. Yep. And remember, if you go for the club tie option, a traditional club tie is only the two colors. It is not like thick stripe, thin stripe, background, you know, like you see like 80s ties or something like that. A club tie is usually just two colors. So specifically search for club tie when you go shopping um, and you'll find various people making them and especially English tailor tailoring companies that offer them. Yeah. So pick something that tones with the tartan. Indeed, but you're gonna look fine. It's gonna and and I envy yeah. you the opportunity. I think it's gonna be a fantastic occasion. You guys are gonna have a great time. So yes, enjoy. Indeed, congratulations on getting to meet the chief. Yeah. So all right, boys and girls. So question of the day, Adam, bring it on up. Would bring you wear on. a kilt when you visit Scotland, or if you were visiting Scotland, would you wear a kilt, and why or why not? Would you be worried about what people think of you? Would you want to do it to connect with your heritage? Tell us down in the comments. Would you wear a kilt while visiting Scotland? That's the question of the day. All one. right. Thank you, boys and girls, for joining us. Until next time, slide your I'm proud to be an American, and I'm here to drink whiskey. Imagine we get dinged for that. My <laughs> because I'm that good. Yeah, yeah. Drove my Chevy <laughs> that would be levee, very weird. This whiskey oh. and rye. Well, you get these, look at that here. Okay, Ian, you get in this chair and you do this. This will be the day that I die. This might be the day that you die. <laughs> <laughs>